Hey, welcome to the show. Have you ever thought about some way to combat drugs? Maybe have drug policies. Maybe have state laws that have drug that prohibit drugs in our schools. What if you were to be subject to randomized drug testing? It's happening in all of our schools. Last month on the GME YouTube channel, when we did our Back to School Month, we focused in on randomized drug testing. If you don't know what it is, if you participate in any extracurricular activities like band, choir, chess club, theater arts, athletics, you are to sign a form saying you will be randomized drug testing. If you refuse, then this is what can happen to you. One school district in Ohio, three years ago, is cracking down on vape. It's not a public institution, it's a Catholic school. And they have the right to choose to randomly drug test students in that school. Let's take a look. Cracking down on vaping and drug use among students, one Ohio school is planning random drug tests for students. So this is a Catholic high school in Ohio. Here's the deal. Students apparently are supposed to consent to this testing to enroll to do it. A letter sent home to the parents of 620 students explained this new program. They're going to be testing at least once a year for illicit drugs, nicotine, alcohol. It's almost set up more in a way like maybe professional sports where they're randomly drug tested alcohol tested, nicotine tested. I'm a little confused by this, Judge Mary. Here's why. The consent, if that's a piece of this, it seems like the kids that are more likely to do illicit drugs, they're not going to consent. So you, the goody two-shoes are going to consent. Oh, yeah, this is great, no problem. So what, what is not, the... You're not coming to my school then. See, this is a private institution. Yeah, it's a Catholic school. So here are the rules. You know, you sign this or you're not going to come here. It's really simple. So, so that they can do that. Sure. Do that. Well, okay. yeah, absolutely. I mean, here are the rules of our school, and you either accept them or you're not. Now, what about the public institutions? They, they can't, can't do, do that. that. Okay. You know, and our federal government, our Supreme Court, has only ruled two times on this issue. Um, and the issue was what, and they found that if you're involved in sports, you must test. And if you're involved in any extracurricular activities, um, you must test as well. And they found that it was constitutional at that point to do it. But for the most part, any type of testing is regulated by state law. And the state can mandate through their constitution or through statutes uh, what they're going to regulate and how they're going to regulate it. So the... Yes, in this particular instance, because it is a private institution, they could test. Now, my concern with this, they're saying they're going to test students at least one time per year, but uh, you can be tested numerous times. And for me, of course, I don't want students to vape. It's dangerous for obvious reasons. But I see a potential here for students to be treated unfairly, meaning there could be one student who's tested once and then another student who's tested numerous times just because. So I, can I, you see? I believe the standard should be there should be a reasonable suspicion that you're either under the influence or were but you actively are fair. involved. But you are a fair person. I could well, see. Well, thank some, you. I appreciate yes. that. Yes, <laughs> yes, which is appropriate. Now I got a new name instead of Sherry. Well, we <laughs> <too, Mary. laughs> no. but, but don't you agree? Like, if you know, there are some some people who would take advantage of this and treat students unfairly. Oh, and, absolutely. And say, well, well, I did think that well, they and, were. You know what, Nita? You you bring up a valid point. But I think as part of it, it should be written in the testing that they have the right if they are suspicious, right. erratic behavior, That's something. Very and then here, here's, what here's, are the benefits of this? Are there benefits for having these rules? Is it acting as a deterrent? They used to use the old scared straight um, program where they would let the kids sit down and take them to the police station. And that's not working anymore. Where's the data that it reduces substance abuse? Where's I'm asking. Not yet. Okay. What, is okay. The, what, what do you think the benefit is of this? I, I'm hoping it would act as a deterrent. And you know, I think it would I can't for go some to kids. school because then my mom and dad are going to know that I'm smoking pot, um, my, you know, or yep. whatever else I might be doing. You know, I'm going to think twice. That's the hope. And I just think we need the research to back it up. If there's any potential to act as a deterrent, I let's think try. It, I, I think, think, let's think But you also have to I protect the right. privacy rights of results, you know, where they're going to go. They can't go into your record. They can't be used to prosecute you um, because you've got the HIPAA laws. Nobody's got a right to know about your medical background. What if the kid's taking other drugs because of an illness that they may have that might conflict? I mean, there's a whole lot of other I think what you're saying is if you implement a policy like this, you can't go into it willy-nilly. You have to have a, a really good right. plan in place. Absolutely. You don't just start randomly drug testing and then we, hey, let's figure out what to do once we get positive drug test results um but yeah maybe maybe in a few years we'll be talking on the show and say you know what we've we have great data that this is a deterrent 
in these particular school districts. And I wish I could say that drug testing is always 100% accurate, but yes. it is not. And when you have those false positives, it can ruin a life. Uh, so it's, it's just there. there's a lot to this. Let's take a break. And there is a lot more to this. Like, like I said last month, we talked about this, and let me tell you, I participated in one extracurricular activity, and I was never subject to any randomized drug testing. Why? Because I was never picked. If I, but if I went, but if I was taking vape, and they have reasonable suspicion, I would consent to saying to be doing this randomized drug testing for one reason, because they have suspicion. If you, if they have reasonable suspicion, you need to start saying, hey. I'm like, hey, they're suspecting I smoke vape. I will be subject to randomized drug testing. We'll make a pee in a cup, and if it comes back you smoke vape, then you get detention. That's what happens in our schools. That's and like I said, in Ohio, they're doing the same thing for vape. But there's plenty more to come about this. We're gonna hear from more of the doctors from 12 years ago, still ahead. The quick start investigation with Chris Hansen, where all you do is buy, recruit, and buy. It's a pattern. But coming up next, more about drug testing in our schools. And Beeville, before the first day of school, which was a month ago, they started to do randomized drug testing for, for vape, along with another school district. Stay with us. Every time we deal with the issue of randomized drug testing, and by we I mean the media, the media, the media does a story about randomized drug testing. It gets in people's faces. Like my chance, I'm be doing this testing, any extra so and so. But with these drug tests, I mean, the Supreme Court has ruled twice for extra activity. So, like I said before, like I said during before the show started. If you are just if you're to uh, participate in any extra any extracurricular activities, you are to be subject to in, to randomized drug testing. They'll call your name, you pee in a cup. If it comes back you did any drugs, you're clear. You can stay in your extracurricular activity. If it comes back you did some drugs, then you're being kicked off. It's reasonable suspicion. I mean, you it's safety issue. You can't be out on the field high. You can get hurt. That schools have a duty to protect you. You don't shed your house, schoolhouse right to the schoolhouse gate. Take a look at this clip from 12 years ago. I'm sure to stir up some emotions. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I can see uh, random drug testing for you know certain groups like pilots and maybe law enforcement, but junior high students. Yeah. I mean, this yeah, is you this can't, is you can't yeah. this, big, this is a big change. If it's becoming a much bigger deal, which according to the study it is, yeah. then then how how else do you do you nip it in the bud? You, know you, you don't let the school board do this in school. The school board buys the test, gives it to the parents who have enrolled a child. You want your child in my classes this month? You do the test. Why? Because if the school does it, they're going to write the name down somewhere. And there's a, a six-year-old, a sixth grader, or a seventh grader who's going to have a record for the rest of his life somewhere. Unnecessary. Make the parent do it. Our parents going to do it. Huh? Our parents going to well, do we've it. we've talked on the show about Let's I don't make... know that it's a good idea as a parent if you're resorting to sending your seventh grader into the bathroom to pee yeah. into a cup. That does not, in my opinion, develop a strong relationship between and child and parent. If, it, if, it, if a kid doesn't want to try drugs, but all his friends are doing it and he's feeling a lot of pressure... He can use this as an excuse that's kind of not with himself. It's like, hey, it's not me, but oh, I'm going to get sorry. tested. I'm going to get tested, and I, so I'm not going to do it. It is. It you is. Know, it's, you know, it's I think it needs to be, and I think you're right, the parents need to be involved with the testing, but I, I think it really needs to be done because by testing them, they'll be able to get them help if they need it. The kids that are taking the drugs, they are going to lie, and these are and these are kids you would look at, and they may be getting A's until the se their senior year and they drop off. You don't know, and then the parent doesn't know, and the school doesn't know, is this something they just tried, or is this a habit that they're addicted to? By finding out, by testing them, they'll be able to get them help if they need it. I think we would all agree that keeping middle schoolers off of right. the drugs yeah, is the, the goal. Is the goal, and just how do you get there is the big controversy. And it is the big controversy that's happening. Even school districts, even school districts are doing things to combat this. I mean, Beville ISD.
Vivo and its stages last month implemented randomized drug testing for vape. I mean, if the state says that you have drug tests for vape, that's what the state says. I mean, can't argue with the state law. But there's more, but there's always more to this than meets the eye when you're looking at randomized drug testing. So, how is Beeville planning to tackle this? Here's Devon Taylor. Drug scares has emerged as a major challenge for educational institutions nationwide, and Beeville is no exception. School administrators have become increasingly alarmed by the prevalence of drugs among students, prompting them to explore proactive measures. Here at Meeple ISD, we work really hard as a committee to develop some random drug testing procedures. We've noticed a really high increase in the use of vapes across Texas, really, and here in our district as well. And so we really wanted to implement something um, in order to create a safe and free environment. In recent months, schools across the country have faced the fear of students getting access to drugs like fentanyl. The Beeville Independent School District is hoping their plan will save lives. And so students, when they come to school and they realize that we're really cracking down on our policies and procedures, regarding drug testing, then they'll take it more seriously and really see the impact that it has on their future and um, student success. Alongside education and awareness programs, the school district is considering random drug testing for students 7th through 12th grade as a potential deterrent, hoping it will discourage students from indulging in these harmful behaviors. Parents and students will have to attend orientation meetings to look over the procedures. They will have, it is mandatory, um, they will not be able to participate in any extracurricular activity until they attend orientation. The policy is expected to take place at the beginning of the school year. In Beeville, Devon Taylor, Chris 6 News. Now, like I said before, I don't want my child being randomly drug tested unless for I don't want my son being my son and green nephew being randomly drug tested unless it's for extracurricular activities. But it's, if it's for vape and they have reasonable suspicion, then I gotta tell them, hey, I gotta say, hey, if if you're vaping and they have reasonable suspicion, you need to consent to drug testing. You say no, and then they're gonna pressure you. Drugs are bad. That's the bottom line here, and. There's another school district that is doing these randomized drug testing in our in these schools. The whole reason that is, I mean, take a look at this from uh, them drugs. Take a look at this clip. Some days I don't have time to look. drug testing for 7th to 12th graders. It's a new policy in a Nebraska school district and it's raising eyebrows. Three News reporter Ron Johnson has more. Ron, good morning. Good morning, Zach and Cerise. It's for students who participate in school-sponsored competitive extracurricular activities in the Creek District. It's also for any high schooler who wants to park in the school's lot. The school board passed it at their meeting in July. The board says it comes after an increase in what they called instances, both on and off school property. The community questioned the board on what exactly led to the policy, the transparency behind the approval, and the concerns for safety of student information. Once these kids do get tested, where is that data going to? Who is gonna, what third, I know it's a third party, who's doing their testing, what information are they gonna have on my kid? That's my biggest concern. We believe that this is in the best interest of our students at this time to provide them a safe, uh, positive learning environment. That's why it was adopted. Again, you may disagree with that. And the policy uses a third party for testing referred to as Sport Safe Testing Services Incorporated. The urine sample testing will take place twice a month and is a requirement to participate in extracurricular activities. Both the parent and the student need to sign it. The board pointed to the community and to frequently ask questions page on the district's website for some answers, but they did acknowledge that some of the questions asked had not been addressed. In the studio this morning, Ron Johnson, 3 News Now. Now, if you saw the portion that documents sixth graders, it didn't say seventh graders, it said sixth graders. It's like for crying out loud, I don't want a 6th grader being drug tested. 
for a freak. I don't want a six degree address. I mean, I want to drug test my child if he wants to park on my property. I mean, it's like, okay, you park on my lot? Okay. Pee in the cup. Okay. <coughs> you can take a meth. Go to the office. It can happen. But one YouTuber, one YouTuber, has told many stories about the times he's been taking, he's been taking drugs. When we come back, we're going to hear from him. He failed his drug test. We're going to hear his story. Still, And then still ahead. These people claim that this company, that this company says you can buy and you can just, you can sell our prize and you get like oh you can get like over a hundred thousand dollars. But Chris Hansen's investigation will explain otherwise. Stay with us. Austin FFA or Luna as he's called has told some specific stories about when he about his drug stories, about when he did drugs, whether it was in school, outside. But we're still in the subject of drug testing. You're gonna hear now from Austin's side as he tells a story, as he tells Two stories about when he failed drug his drug test. Let's take a look. Guys, this is Austin here or Luna. Today's story time is a pretty good one in my opinion. It was a very, very, very close call. I think you guys are really gonna enjoy it. If you do, leave a like on this video and let's jump right into today's story time. So today's story all takes place when I was 15 years old. Yeah, 15. A little bit young to be doing what I was doing at the time. I was smoking a little bit and uh you know, it's not really being the best 15-year-old I could be. I was kind of giving my mom a hard time, my dad a hard time. They were, like, kind of pissed off at me because I was skipping school and sneaking out at night and doing things that a 15-year-old probably shouldn't be doing. That's a little bit more common for, like, a 16 or a 17-year-old, but, like, I don't know. Just me at 15, I was kind of being a little bit of a shithead. But anyway, I was smoking weed at this time, which I have to say before I go further in the story, if you're 15 and watching this video, don't go repeat anything I talk about in this story time. It's just for entertainment. But anyway, yeah, when I was 15, I just didn't really give a shit about anything. And uh, I was smoking weed a lot, and I was sneaking out at night and doing that. And uh, one night, I stuck out with my friend, and we smoked a J together. And I came back in through my window at 3 in the morning, and my mom was sitting there waiting for me. With an entire drug test kit, just waiting for me. And I jump in through my window, and she sees me, and she goes, So what are you doing out there, Austin? I was like, nothing. And she goes, pee in the cup. And she throws it at me. And in my head, I'm like, oh, I'm so fucked. Like, it's over. I'm done. So uh, I go in the bathroom. I pee in the cup. And I just knew I was fucked. I knew that I was going to fail this. I literally had just smoked. My eyes were still red. My only question to myself was, like, what's going to happen after I fail this? Like, is she just going to ground me? Is she going to put me in some boarding school or something with a bunch of other bad kids? Like, what's going to happen? So I walk in the room. I hand her the cup. She walks out of the room. And uh, she comes back in about 15 minutes later. And she goes, well, guess what? You passed. And you should have seen the look on my face. I was like, wait, what? Are you serious? And she goes, yeah, you surprised? Because I'm fucking lying. You didn't pass. You failed. I think that was the worst I've ever been trolled in my entire life. I really thought for a second that I actually passed that test and that I didn't have any THC in my body. But anyway, this is just the start of the story, okay? So after I failed this test, my mom goes, okay, listen, this is the last time I'm going to say this. This is your final warning. If I catch you sneaking out again, if I catch you smoking weed again, if I catch you doing anything, I'm sending you to juvie. Now, she wasn't actually going to send me to an actual jail that's, like, ran by the police, but there was this place right down the street from my house that was basically like a boarding school slash jail for bad kids. Like, actually, there was legit, like, detention centers there. Like, no joke, you would go to school every day, and after school... You would go back to your little room with nothing in it, no computer, no TV, no anything. The door would lock, and you basically had to wait for the next day until you go to school again and repeat the cycle. Only reason I'm calling it Juvie is because it basically was Juvie. I don't want to say the name of the actual school itself or the building because that'll give away, you know, where I live in here. But yeah, for the sake of the story, let's just call it Juvie, okay? So she says that she's going to send me there if I get caught doing anything else ever again. Now, me being 15 and naive and just, like, ignorant... I didn't believe a word she said. I thought she was bluffing. I thought she was full of shit. And she walks out of my room and doesn't ground me. Doesn't do anything. So at this point, I really thought I was off the hook. I was like, oh, I'm going to sneak out every night. I'm good. Like, she's not going to do anything. She's all bark, no bite. She's just threatening me. Like, I'm good. 
I really thought I was fine to just keep going about what I was doing, smoking weed every night, sneaking out, doing anything I wanted with my friends. So fast forward to about a month later, I'm still sneaking out almost every night, still smoking weed with my friends, just being a little shithead, right? And at this point, I thought that I was really just like off the hook. I thought my mom just stopped caring. I thought she knew that I was sneaking out every night and that, you know, I was just kind of like free to do whatever I wanted. But then one night came along, a little bit over a month later from when I first got caught, where I was out with some friends, I snuck out at like midnight out my window, and I smoked a J with two people, and I went back, I crawled through my window, and I lay down in bed, and my mom walks in, and she goes, where you been tonight, huh? And I was like, what, what do you mean? I was sleeping. She goes, no, you weren't. I woke up at 10, I looked in your room, you were gone. My mom would usually go to bed early, she'd usually go to bed at like 9, so after 9 I would just sneak out. So yeah, she woke up an hour later and saw that I wasn't at home, so I was caught. And she goes, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to walk in the other room, I'm going to grab another one of those drug tests, you're going to take the drug test, if it's positive for THC, I'm bringing you to Juvie tomorrow, and you're staying there for a month, and if it's not positive, you can keep staying home. And at this point, I'm like, oh shit, I am so 110% fucked, I am going to go to children's jail, like I'm done, like this is it, like I'm going to be positive, I smoked tonight and all month, I'm done. So I run in the bathroom with a little cup to pee in, and I'm freaking out. I'm sitting there just, like, freaking out. I don't know what to do, right? And then I think... About it for a second. And I start thinking about one of my friends. I have this one friend. Let's just call him AJ. AJ lived two houses down from me in my neighborhood. He wasn't really a close friend of mine, I didn't see him very often, but he was like my neighbor friend, you know, like he was always one of my friends since I was a kid. So I call up AJ, and I can tell I woke him up, he's like, hello? I was like, yo man, sorry, did I wake you up? He's like, yeah, what's good? I was like, bro, I'm getting drug tested right now, like I'm in my bathroom, two houses down, I'm going to fail this, and if I do fail it, I'm gonna have to go to like a child's detention center, like juvie. And he's like, are you serious? I was like, yeah, dude, when's the last time you smoked weed? He's like, I've never smoked before. I was like, really? He's like, yeah. Now, AJ was like the same age as me. He was like 15 or 16 at the time. So this was just news to my ears. I was so happy. I was like, AJ, you have to do me this favor, bro. You have to run over here really quick, take the cup out the window, pee outside, and then bring it back to me really fast, like right now. He's like, dude, I can't sneak out right now. Like, I'll be fucking grounded. I was like, dude, you would be literally saving my life. Like, if I don't pass this test, I'm going to go to children's jail. He's like, all right, man, fuck it. All right, I'm coming over right now. So he hangs up the phone. I give it about a minute, and my mom knocks on the door. And she's like, are you good? Like, are you done? What's going on? I was like, just give me one more minute. I'm having some trouble. And she walks away from the door. And right after she walks away, I hear a really tiny tap on my bathroom window. Now, my bathroom was on the first floor of my house. It wasn't on the second floor or anything. So it was really easy to access, and it was eye level. So when I look at the window and who was tapping on it, it was my good friend AJ, there to save the fucking day. So I open up my window and I hand AJ the cup. He then runs away behind my house, pees in the cup, runs it back over, hands it to me, and he goes, you fucking owe me, dude. And he runs away back to his house. To which I explode with excitement that I'm probably not going to go to fucking jail. So after AJ was long gone, I turn around, I open the bathroom door, I hand my mom the cup. She luckily didn't hear me talking to AJ at all. We were whispering very quietly, and I had the bathroom sink on, so it drowned out some of that noise. And yeah, after I handed her the test, she walked away, and she ran the test. And about 15, 20 minutes later, she walks in my room, and she goes, All right, you passed. And this time, I wasn't like, Oh, really? I was just like, Yeah, I know. And she goes, Yeah, you seem confident. I was like, Yeah, because I haven't been smoking. And she goes, Yep, you're right. Good job. Like, keep it up. And she walks out of my room. And I have never felt more relieved in my entire fucking life. And I remember just calling up AJ and being like, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Like, you're the fucking best, bro. Like, I love you. And he's like, yeah, man, you owe me. And he's right. I did owe him. And I ended up repaying him by buying him the new COD Prestige Edition. So I had to pay like a hundred bucks for that thing. It was like over a hundred or something. All I know is that it was a lot of money for a 15-year-old to be spending. I had to spend like half my birthday money on the thing. But I was cool with that. I was like, yeah, man, like, thank you so much. So yeah, I didn't have to go to juvie, I didn't have to go to the child detention center, I was all good, I learned my lesson definitely, I stopped smoking for a while after that, because I didn't want to get caught again, and then actually go to juvie or anything, and AJ saved my damn life, so shout out to AJ, moral of this story is, don't be like 15 year old Luna, that's pretty much it.
But anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this story time. I thought it was a pretty crazy one. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like on the video. I'd really appreciate it. Feel free to leave your story times in the comments down below. And subscribe if you're new. I'll see you guys all later. Peace. Now, in his case, he almost went to jail. Let's take a look at what happened. Let's take a look at this from uh, four years ago. When he failed his drug test, but did he get, but when he got caught, did he go to jail or did he go to juvie? Because if you fail, if you fail your drug test, you will be, you will, you may be going to juvie. Take a look. What's here, guys? It's Austin here, or Luna. So today's story time kind of brings me back to my roots, I would say, okay? This story time takes place when I was 16 years old. Now, this all starts off as a normal day for me. I woke up. It was like 12 p.m. It was a Saturday. And my friend hit me up. He's like, yo, do you want to come over today? And I was like, yeah, man, that sounds good. He's like, all right, I'll come pick you up right now. I was like, all right, dope. So I went over to the kitchen, saw my mom. I was like, hey, mom, can I hang out with my friend today? She's like, yeah, for sure. Who is it? I told her who. And my friend came and picked me up. Everything was going great so far. I looked like it was going to be a good Saturday. And it, it was, I would say. It started off great. Um, I went over to my friend's house. He started smoking some weed. At the time, I was smoking, so I smoked with him. And after a few hours of hanging out with my friend, my friend had to take me home because he had to go to dinner that night with his family. So he took me home, and I walked through the front door, not even thinking about the fact that my eyes were probably beet red. And my mom looked at me immediately after I walked in. And she's like, why are your eyes so red? And I was like, I don't know. I fell asleep in the car on the way here. That could have done it. And she's like, oh, okay, well, I'm going out with some friends tonight. Are you going to be good here? I was like, yeah, I'll be fine. So my mom went to her room. I went into my room, got on Xbox, started playing some Call of Duty. And then my mom went out with her friends. And I thought the night was going good so far. I was like, this is, this is great. Like, I almost got caught, but I didn't. And everything's fine. Now I'm just going to play some Call of Duty and enjoy the rest of my night. And that's what I did. I stayed up till like, 3 in the morning playing COD, and then I fell asleep. And I remember waking up at, like, 10 a.m. to a knock on my bedroom door, and my mom opens the door. And she's like, hey, you're doing this today. And she holds up a box. And it was a fucking home drug test kit. And I was like, "What? why? And she's like, because I know what you were up to last night. And I was just like, what are you talking about? And in my head, I'm just like, oh, I'm fucked. I'm so fucked right now. Like, why am I even lying to her? And she's like, look, if you haven't been smoking pot, well, no, because the test will tell us. So whenever you're ready, take this cup into the bathroom and bring it to me when you're done. And I was like, okay. And she's like, you know what? I'm just going to leave it in the bathroom. You can go in there whenever you're ready. And I was like, okay. So she goes in there, puts the cup there, and then I hear her walk away down the hallway. And I'm thinking to myself, like, fuck, fuck, what do I do? So I start texting everybody I know that lives near me, and no one's responding. And then I call my one friend who lives, like, right down the street. And I'm like, dude, I need your fucking help, like, right now. He's like, what's wrong, man? I'm like, my mom just walked into my room with a drug test, and she wants me to piss in the cup. And I've been smoking the last couple of months, so I know I'm going to fail the test, and I don't know what's going to happen after that. And he's like, oh, fuck, you really are fucked. I'm like, yeah. So can you do me a favor? And he's like, yeah, man, of course, anything. I was like, look, can you please pee in like a little cup and wrap it in saran wrap and then bring it to my house now and give it to me through the window or something? And he's like, what? You want my piss? I'm like, yeah, I know it's weird, dude, but I'm in a fucking desperate time. He's like, dude, I wish I could, but I can't. I'm like, why? He's like, because I smoked. I'm like, what since when? When did you smoke weed? You hate weed. He's like, I know, man, but my friends were smoking last week, so I smoked with them a few times. And I was like, a few times, dude, why? I thought it makes you anxious. He's like, it did, but I don't know, I just kept doing it. I was like, alright dude, whatever, I'm gonna have to try and call some other people. He's like, alright man, good luck, let me know what happens. So me and him hang up, I call another friend of mine, he doesn't answer, then I call another friend, he didn't answer, and at that point I was out of options because nobody else really lived near me. And then I kind of thought to myself, like, dude, Austin, you look pathetic, man. Like, you're really trying to get someone's piss? That's weird. So I just stood up, and I thought to myself, like, here we go. I'm about to take my loss, and I went to the bathroom, I peed in the little fucking cup, and then I brought the cup out and put it on the kitchen table, and I was like, have fun, and I walked out of the kitchen, and my mom was just giving me this weird look. So after this, I went into my room, and literally, like, hours went by, and my mom didn't come to my room, and I was like, what the fuck, like, did I pass somehow? Like, did I just get extremely lucky, and, like, the test fucked up? But that wasn't the case. I wasn't lucky at all. I fell asleep, and the next morning, I wake up to my mom knocking on my bedroom door, and I was like, yeah, come in. She walks in. It was so early in the morning, I was exhausted. And she's like, hey, yeah, the test shows that you smoked pot. And I was like, fuck. And she's like, yeah, I think you know the drill. You're not going anywhere for a while. And I was like, how long? And she goes, until I feel like letting you go places. Give me your phone. I was like, fuck. So I grab my phone, give her my phone. And she's like, okay, enjoy your day. She turns around and walks out of my room. 
And a couple hours later, when I wasn't in my room, she went into my room and took all my Xbox 360 games, too, and my controller, but she didn't know that I had a spare controller in my closet, and I had NW2 downloaded on my Xbox, so I was chilling. Like, literally, I just played NW2 pretty much for the whole remainder of me being grounded and shit, and pretty much, that was, yeah, a shitty few weeks. It sucked, but you know what? Could have been worse, and yeah, moral of the story is, uh, I don't know, don't be a dumbass like me at a young age. But yeah, guys, that's pretty much the story time of how I failed the drug test. I hope you enjoyed the story time. If you did, please leave a like on the video. I really appreciate it. Leave you guys' stories in the comments down below. Subscribe if you're new. I'll see you guys all later. Peace. No, the moral of the story is don't be taking any drugs. If your parents subject you to drug tests, take take the drug test. Don't go freaking calling up your neighbors, your friends, and saying, hey, can you come by and piss in a cup? And they're like, you want my piss? Like, I know it sounds weird, but I'm going to fail a drug test. Well, so, so take your punishment, whatever. Don't sit up here and say to yourself, hey, you know, I'll, I won't take someone else's pee. Remember the episode of Family Guy where Brian gets a bus for smoking, for smoking pot and he uses Stewie's urine to pass a drug test? They're going to know it was somebody. And if you would have, you would have passed somebody's with someone's urine... You'd be in trouble. That's the moral here. Alright. Coming up next. These people say that if you want to get rich quick, you sell some stuff. This person says he can help out by making a lot of dough. Chris Hansen with a Dateline Hidden Camera Investigation. Stay with us. If you ever find a way to get rich quick, what if you would develop a plan that would help you get rich quick by selling some stuff and buying some stuff? The only old saying, to make money you gotta spend money, and to spend money you gotta have money. Tonight, we're gonna take you to a crowded room to where you can make some, you can make a lot of dough. And we'll also show you, we'll also show you a company that does the same thing like what the crowd is doing. We'll also show you a false trail of, of false promises and broken dreams. Here's Chris Hansen with the Dayline Hidden Camera Investigation. Out of the darkness of a crowded coliseum, a rally cry. Thousands of true believers gathered in celebration at arenas like this across the country, all convinced they found the true path to success, and well beyond their wildest dreams. This is the best opportunity that exists in the world! The promises are golden. You can get one more bottle, make the millions and millions and millions of dollars, but it must start with a dream. And dream they do of luxury homes, fancy cars, yachts, and private planes. So who are all these people? What are they so worked up about? The people on stage are distributors for a company called Quickstar, which says it's had $3 billion in sales since 1999. They say the company's special formula for success has made them rich. But their main purpose here is to tell all these thousands of other distributors that they can do it too. All they have to do is sell everything from the company's own line of vitamins and cosmetics to name brand appliances and electronics. For that, they'll get a percentage of the sales. And if they recruit a ton of other people to do the same, they'll get a percentage of the orders placed by everyone they recruit. The more people they recruit, the richer they can get. And richer and richer and richer. You can do it. So why not go for it? Sound too good to be true? We thought it did. In fact, it sounded a lot like another company that made news several years back, Amway. A hugely successful business that came under government scrutiny was fined in order to stop making unrealistic promises about income to its distributors. 
To find out what Quickstar was up to, we took our hidden cameras to a recruitment meeting in New Jersey. Hundreds held around the country each week, and where hundreds of thousands of Quickstar faithful get their start. And the first thing we hear is how easy it is to make it in Quickstar. This is your own business. You can generate the next 12 to 18 months. I'm sorry. How much? You're making um, more than 250 quarter of a million? The recruiter, Greg Fredericks, sure gets our attention. He says he himself has made it big on the Quickstar plan. I don't know about nothing. You know, and today, I'm going to have a million dollar home. And he says those kinds of riches are ours for the taking. And on top of getting rich, we'd also be able to make our own hours and spend more time with our family. So at another meeting, after paying $200 for a starter kit, we sign up and are officially introduced to the Fredericks team. First step, think positive. So I don't put anything into my head that's going to cause me to be thinking outside my body. That means no TV, no reading newspaper. Second step, and perhaps the most important, we're told to buy motivational books and tapes from top Quickstar distributors. A reading, I would recommend you start reading in 15 minutes to about a half hour. Those books and tapes are going to cost us, but one of Frederick's associates says they hold the key to our success. But it's not just buying the books and tapes, which can go for about $60 a month. We're also urged to spend money on seminars for about another $50 a month. And within days of becoming Quickstar distributors, we're told of one big event we shouldn't miss. A few hundred dollars later, we find ourselves on a bus ride, a 14-hour bus ride from New Jersey to South Carolina, something called Spring Leadership Weekend. To Fredericks and others, it's not just a business trip, it's a pilgrimage. Well, we ask you for a spirit of openness so that we might go down to Greenville, South Carolina, Lord, we that we might be changed. In Jesus' mighty name, say amen. Let's have a great weekend. At the arena in South Carolina, people have been sleeping outside like teenagers at a rock concert. When we arrive the next day, it's not long before the crowd swells. Part of a fevered rush to get inside. 15,000 at the arena. Thrilled to a carefully choreographed show that promises money. And everything that comes with it. We're urged by those successful Quickstar distributors on stage to dream big like they do. We got four homes and 32 cars and we got all that. What are we doing now? And we just say, let's buy the country. <laughs> the excitement builds with each success story. This man says he once ran a car wash. His vision of financial freedom moves the crowd to a chant we hear over and over again. The speakers are treated like superstars, all living testaments to what happened when you follow the Quickstar plan. But there's one who's become an icon. If Quickstar is a religion, this man is its pope. His name is Bill Britt, and legend has it he's worth millions, all because of Quickstar.
out with us become sleep deprived, afraid to miss out on advice that will make them millionaires. Such devotion is hard to fathom. But we see just how far it goes on the last night of the weekend when a single candle is lit. Soon the dark arena becomes a tabernacle, a shrine to the quick star dream. For some, a solemn and tearful promise to their leader. But are the leaders keeping their promises to the faithful? the thousands of lighting candles in this arena don't realize is that 99.9% .9 of them will not only never get rich from Quickstar, won't even come close. In your opinion, what is it? I would use the word scam. What well, is Quickstar a scam just to take away people's money or is it the real deal? When we come back, we're going to show you more hidden camera footage and you also meet a man who shot his own alarm clock on a viral videotape. Chris Hansen with the conclusion of promising easy money with false advertisement. Stay with us. So far, you've seen people buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, chant and sell, buy and sell, chant and sell, buy and sell, chant and sell. For a company called Quickstar, which is actually Amway, we've shown you any camera footage, we've shown you it the crowds, we showed you a bunch of money that, that Dateline has spent. Now, but, but now there's more to the story. You're about to meet a man who ceremoniously shot, shot his own alarm clock. Once again, Chris Hansen. Uh. The freedom to flush that stinking job. That's the promise. And that's exactly what Eric Scheidler did. I thought if I could create a six-figure income uh, and spend time with my family, I'd do anything for that. Scheidler, at the time a federal auditor, had heard the stories and seen the videos. You know, we get up in the morning as we wish. Don't get up to the alarm clock very often. Uh, it's uh, something we sort of gave up and we got rid of the job. Scheidler signed up, and after a few years working part-time in the business, ceremoniously shot his own alarm clock. <laughs> he triumphantly quit his day job, and with a limo waiting, it was party time. Walked into the welcoming arms of his family and friends in the business. Goodbye, boss. Hello, family. That's right. Exactly. Same with the American dream. Where's that boss? But instead of a life of leisure and more time with his family, he says he worked day and night, buying the tapes, attending the rallies. Still, he made nowhere near the six-figure salary he thought he would. In fact, in his best year, he made $34,000. And even that didn't last. What do you have today? Uh, who are destitute? Financially. It's, uh, we'll change that. But financially, we have nothing as a specific result of this. We heard it again and again. People who worked the quick start plan only to suffer in the end. It's hurt us. It's hurt a lot of people. And Vicky and Lindy Max say they not only didn't make money, they lost more than $35,000 over a five-year period, much of it on books, tapes, and traveling to rallies. That, by the way, is like a year at Harvard. No kidding. I know that. We know that. So why, despite the promises, did the Max and thousands of others end up on the losing end of the quick star dream? This man says it's because it's based on a lie, and he should know. His name is Bo Short, and for a time he was selling the dream himself as one of quick star's brightest stars. I will tell you this, I do not want you to leave excited. I want you to leave committed. But he says he began to realize it was part of a mass deception. You see these videos of these attractive couples driving Porsches and Ferraris, panoramic shots of the palatial mansion, right? Is that actually achievable by selling quickshot products? Based on my experiences, no. How are these people getting all this stuff then? There is another business. And it's a business that is completely separate from Quickstar. 
of hidden business that most recruits don't realize exists. Short says many of those high-level distributors singing the praises of Quickstar on stage are actually making most of their money by selling motivational books, tapes, and seminars. Not Quickstar's cosmetics, soaps, and electronics. This was the dirty little secret. That's exactly what it was. Absolutely. That's not what you hear at the convention. No, and that's not what you're told in somebody's living room when you see it either. In fact, about 20 high-level distributors are part of an exclusive club, one that those hundreds of thousands of other distributors don't get to join. For years, only a privileged few, including Bill Britt, have run hugely profitable businesses, selling all those books, tapes, and seminars. Things the rank-and-file distributors can't sell themselves, but are told over and over again they need to buy in order to succeed. The only thing you need to become successful, you don't have at your disposal. All you have to be willing to do for a phenomenal thing is to start purchasing the materials that will help you build your business. Why are the recruits told to listen to the tapes and read the books over and over and over again? Because it creates a dependency and it creates a habit that keeps you bound to that business. Vicki Mack knows all about that. Even though she's a medical doctor, a pediatrician with a thriving practice, she found herself slaving away in the pursuit of new Quickstar recruits. After all, new recruits mean new sales. New sales mean more money. We'd be out just even hanging out at McDonald's, at the play places, talking to parents. At McDonald's? Yeah. Now, you graduated from Berkeley. Mm-hmm. Went to medical school. Mm -hmm. Making a very fine salary as a pediatrician. Yeah. And yet you're in a mall at a McDonald's on a Saturday trying to sell this thing? Yeah. <laughs> None of this surprises Bo Short. Not the commitment of time and money, not the emotion, as we saw at the rally we attended. There's a man with tears. There are probably many people with tears. And not all of those tears are because they're committed to it. Many of those tears are because they, they have worked diligently and are not any closer. If this is not a legitimate business opportunity, then in reality, in your opinion, what is it? I would use the word scam. That's what I was thinking too. Bo Short says when he and several other high-level distributors began to suspect the same thing, they confronted the company's managing director, Ken McDonald. And I said, Ken, I believe that people are stealing money and you're letting it happen. And he didn't respond. Uh, and I remember looking at him a few minutes later and said, Ken, kick some of them out. Show people you're serious. And he looked at me and said, well, what would happen to the business? Short says the company acknowledged it had been aware of the problem for decades. How could that be? Remember when we said Quickstar sounded a little like Amway? a company which drew the ire of the federal government several years back for making false promises to recruits? Well, it turns out Quickstar isn't just like Amway, it was Amway. Quickstar is just its new incarnation, with many of the same players. Eric Scheidler and the Max began as Amway distributors, and many of those same high-level Quickstar distributors also began with Amway. So did Bo Short, who says he decided to walk away from the business and all the money that came with it. You were a poster boy for this outfit. You were on the company yacht. Are you now turning around and biting the hand that fed you? I don't care if anyone thinks I'm biting anyone's hand that fed me. I'm telling the truth. Quickstar declined to be interviewed on camera, but its managing director, Ken McDonald, says in a letter that Short's recollection of events is misleading and in question Short's motivation for speaking out. Short does run a small direct marketing firm himself. Quickstar considers him a potential competitor. Quickstar also says it prohibits its independent distributors from making exaggerated claims about income. As for the company's income, most of that comes from the sale of products, not from tapes and books and tickets to rallies. In its contracts, the company discloses that some distributors do make money from those sales, 
but that buying those materials is strictly voluntary. As for Bill Britt and some of the other top-level distributors we saw on stage, they also declined our request for an on-camera interview. But their lawyer told us in a letter that the income claims we heard are not promoted or endorsed by Britt and those other top distributors. He also wrote that buying the books and tapes is voluntary, and that how much they make from those sales is not available. So how much does a Quickstar distributor really make? Well, only about $1,400 per year. What's the source for that figure? It's Quickstar itself. You can find it in the fine print of the company's own registration materials. $1,400. That's $248,600 less than what our recruiter, Greg Fredericks, said we could make. We caught up with him at one of his recruitment meetings. We're doing a story on Quickstar and Quickstar Distributors. Okay. And these folks here work with me. Oh, great. We wanted to ask you a couple questions. Sure. Okay, I just want to make sure I know you're going to help. First, we reminded him about the money he said we could make. You're making um, more than 250 quarter million? Why are you really making? How about this? Go to a quarter of a million dollars. I don't work in your late 50. This is, you know, it's week from. But I'm not going to disclose you my information as far as my personal income. But what he did let slip when he didn't know the camera was rolling was that one of the elite distributors we saw on stage is making most of his money from the motivation business. Probably three quarters of it. And that's from seminar, holding seminars, seminars, rallies, functions, motivational tools, tapes, books, uh, speaking engagements, appearances. But he didn't seem to remember saying that. I don't know. Oh, I'm not one of the main folks. That I don't know. You're mentioning a number here, three quarters of what his income. That's what you said, not what I said. Did I say that? And that's about all he had to say. Well, okay. I just, I got him up. Later, we found out something else about Frederick. Back in the mid '90s, he was arrested and charged with possession of crack cocaine, and is still wanted by police to face charges in North Carolina. What about others involved in Quickstar? Both the FBI and the criminal division of the IRS are making separate inquiries into at least two top distributors not focused on in this report. In the meantime, hundreds of thousands of true believers are drawn into Quickstar every year, dazzled by the promise of the good life. But unless things change, says Bo Short, it's a broken promise that will leave broken hearts. I think people are being hurt. Because understand, the majority of the people in that audience believe or desperately, desperately want to believe God. And they sit there with their hearts in it. What about them? Some former high-level distributors have filed a lawsuit against Quickstar in federal court, accusing the company of antitrust violations and conspiracy. Quickstar disputes the allegations and says it hopes the matter will be resolved through arbitration. For more on this story, log on to our website. The address is dateline.msnbc.com. Okay, now I went through all my common sense, but we're out of time. But our Royal Bank is coming up next. Stay with us. Early in the broadcast, we focused in on randomized drug testing. That brings us to our viral break. Tonight's final break is the question, can schools legally force you to take a drug test? Take a look. Schools make you take a random drug test? All right, class, random drug test time. Everyone take a cup. Ah, oh, man, it no. hurts. I don't like this, teacher. No, schools can't just randomly drug test a whole student body. They can test individuals if they have reasonable suspicion. Pee in this. Why? I think my suspicions are reasonable. I'm not peeing in your cup. You can't hold it forever. Oh, no. I'll wait. Nope. A teacher like that should be fired and probably put on some sort of list. You can refuse, but you may face punishments like detention, suspension, or loss of privileges. All right, team. Random drug test time. Everyone take a cup. But you need reasonable suspicion. Not when you're in an extracurricular. We can drug test you anytime we like. Well, we can refuse. Sure, but then you're off the team. I heard some states and school districts offer more protections. Sure, check your local state laws and school district policies but for the purposes of this video we don't live in those areas so either pee and play or walk away um everything the football coach said and did in this one was actually correct so no further explanation go eagles the short common sense of this video and for actually 
I don't, I have like, I'm going to give you like two minutes of my common sense here, so. And I'm trying to set up the common sense alert, so. Because I was afraid like we didn't have that time, so, um. Let's, let's, uh, let's raise our common sense alert. Look up your state laws and basically, and basically just look up your state laws and schools have protection. Just, just look up your, just look up your state laws. That's the basic common sense I have. And, um, as for the quick start story, I'm going to give you my common sense about it on a Friday. So look for that video as well. That's game break for this Wednesday going to Thursday. A reminder, we are off for a few weeks for Throwback Thursday. So we'll see you again. We'll see you again in a few weeks for game for Throwback Thursday. And we'll also see you again for game break Friday. For everyone here at YouTube, good night, everyone.